Good afternoon, good morning, dear colleagues, dear participants. Welcome to the IEU monthly learning talk. My name is Aiden Kerbekova. I am an evaluations assistant consultant at the IEU, and I'll be moderating this talk. This learning talk is dedicated to just transition, a topic gaining more and more prominence in the international climate policy arena. In line with the IEU's mandate to support the learning function of the GCF, the unit in cooperation with International Labour Organization launched an evidence review on just transition interventions in developing countries early this year. Tackling climate change requires urgent structural changes in how goods and services are produced and resources are managed around the world. Some of these changes will have profound consequences for communities and local economies, especially in places where people are reliant on unsustainable practices. As many of you are of these places, I am from one of these places, fossil fuel rich and extraction industries reliant Kazakhstan. Um, in addition to posing new risks and losses, the transition to green economy is expected to create new economic and social development opportunities. How those risks and opportunities are mitigated and distributed across society and the extent to which diverse groups are involved in decision making that will affect their lives will determine if the transition to a low carbon and environmentally sustainable world is just. While there is no consensus on what just transition is, the ILO published guidelines for just transition in 2015, uh, which defined it as greening the economy in a way that is as fair and inclusive as possible to everyone concerned, creating decent work opportunities and leaving no one behind. The same year, the Paris Agreement in its preamble explicitly recognized the need to take into account the imperatives of a just transition of the work wor workforce and the creation of decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development priorities. While perception on what just transition might vary from country to country, what is important though is that each country fosters an ongoing dialogue to develop a common vision for what a just transition means for their impacted workers, communities and businesses. And to dis discuss this important topic, we have an excellent panel here um, made of Martin Prowse, IU's evaluation specialist, Camila Roman, I ILO's policy specialist, uh, who will present the findings from the evidence review on just transition. Martin and Camila will be also joined by our third discussant, Anurag Mishra, senior renewable energy specialist from GCF's Division of Mitigation and Adaptation will provide a more granular and practical perspective uh, to our discussion. Thank you very much for joining. And before I give the floor, I just wanted to also say thanks to um, Karin Velaj, who has been helping us to put this event together and all the other IU events throughout the year. And now over to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Aiden. And uh, thank you colleagues for joining us in the on the 12th floor here. Um, to cover the findings from the Realist Review on Just Transition as completed uh, alongside the co-funding agency, the International Labour Organization. My name is Martin Browse, Evaluation Specialist in the IU, and we're, we're very grateful to, uh, to benefit from the time of our, our close colleague from DMA, Anurag Mishra, um, who will offer his comments and reflections on, on the findings that we present, um, present today. Um, so as Highlighted by Aiden, Just Transition is a strategic approach to climate goals and sustainable development, whilst minimizing risks and maximizing opportunities. Um, so a Just Transition contributes to climate goals at the same time as ensuring a fairness in process, limited inequality of outcomes, and also inclusive social dialogue and stakeholder engagement. And whilst each Just Transition, which are all at a very, very formative early stage in in non-Annex 1 developing countries. Um, whilst they're very context specific, there's also ample room for co-learning across, across countries, especially across developing countries. And this is, this is one of the contributions that this evidence review um, aims, to, aims to make. Um, so the, the review that we're covering today takes a very different approach to the approach we've taken in, in other I, recent IU evidence reviews, for example, on behavioral science, um, with, with IFAD, Women's Empowerment, with IFAD or, or Transformational Change, with the Climate Investment Funds. And for those evidence reviews, we completed 
We focused on causal evidence, so we completed evidence gap maps and, and systematic reviews um, to, to look at which interventions work and, and which factors moderate that, that effectiveness. Um, this review is very different because just transitions are, are, at such an, are at such an early stage. And because of that, we've, we've approached it using a realist review uh, methodology, if you like. And we'll now, we'll out, I'll now outline the, the approach we've taken and some of the overall findings, then hand over to, to Camilla, who will outline some of the sectoral level findings. And, and then we'll complete the presentation by, by highlighting the, the common enablers, the, the, the common barriers, and, and an overall synthesis of the, of the review. Um, so the aim of the review um, is, to, is to provide a, a succinct summary um, to, to programming units and policymakers um, to inform program design and delivery on just transition. And we cover, we cover four sectors, so energy, agriculture, and food, infrastructure, and ecosystem services. And we've, we've assessed um, we, what evidence exists regarding just transition interventions um, we've examined the underlying program theories of these interventions and highlighted how the particular enablers and barriers um, to contributing to a just transition can be clustered uh, most uh, most effectively and and this has been through this has been through examining the the underlying the underlying theories of change um, within a range of studies um, next slide please so this realist review focuses on how, for whom, and under what circumstances intervention function in complex environments. So this approach goes beyond the effectiveness evaluations or the effectiveness reviews that we've completed within, within other recent evidence reviews. We utilize the PICO model, so the population intervention comparison outcome model, um, to, for our inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we used a, a purposive sampling approach, not a random sampling approach, because we needed to exclude um, all Annex 1 and Annex 2 countries from the, um, from, from, from the study. And we used rigorous um, search methods and predetermined selection criteria. And in essence, the review developed sectoral level theories of change for a just transition across the four sectors highlighted, and then compared these to the actual intervention theories of change, and which were aggregated at the sectoral level and at the overall level. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the search process, we combine both um, databases and gray material. Uh, we, we selected 30 institutional websites um, to select studies from, and we went through the typical process of title and abstract screening, full text screening, and then a final validation and verification check at the data extraction stage. Next slide, please. So, after, after collecting the, the studies, we had over almost 9,000 studies, and through the title and abstract screening, full text screening, we were left with 122 studies. Um, so we whittled, we whittled the number of studies away according to our inclusion and exclusion criteria. And then further through the data extraction process, these were reduced further to 76 studies, which included 99 specific interventions um, that were contributing um, towards a just transition um, across the four sectors um, that we've, we've highlighted. Next slide, please. So from these 99, 99 interventions, uh, we, we developed a bespoke data extraction tool, and we, we extracted both explicit but also implicit theories of change for each of these 99 interventions. And we clustered these at the sectoral level and also at the overall level. And then we compared these to our original theories of change that we developed um, before, um, before collating the studies and, and whittling the studies down in this manner. So the form of analysis that we completed in the review was um, simple descriptive statistics. Um, we also recreated um, theories of change, looking, focusing on enablers, barriers, inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes um, for each of the, each of the interventions also at the sectoral level and at the overall level. And then we mapped the, the relationship between the particular activities uh, within, within each of the interventions and at the sectoral level and overall, and the outcomes um, that were observed. And so in this sense, some of the graphics that we'll run through now essentially show the incidence 
of combinations of activities and outcomes um, at the sectoral level and, and overall. And this approach to conducting a, an evidence review, a realist review, it doesn't, doesn't allow the authors to make sort of strong statements around or normative statements around what should or what, what, what should take place. Instead, it really allows, allows the authors to make, make statements around factors that policymakers need to be mindful of. And essentially, we offer a series of suggestions um, that, that programming, programming units um, should, be, um, should be mindful of and aware of as, as funding agencies, including the GCF, um, help advance just transitions um, within, within these sectors and overall. Next slide, please. So like all studies, we had a number of limitations in this particular studies. Um, firstly, the main limitation here was the, the language limitation. Um, so we only, we only screened and included English language, um, English language material. Um, and this, this shows up in the descriptive statistics. For example, we have a very limited number of studies from Latin America, a real paucity of studies there. And that, um, that, that's reflective of, of the limitation of this approach. And we're also very aware of the limitations of, of interpretation and limitations when working on sort of context-specific interventions. So just transitions, very, very context-specific, um, although there is ample scope for co-learning across countries. And in that sense, that, that importance of context means that we can easily impart forms of, sort of interpretation bias, if you like, or, or judge, judgment bias when we do, when we do code up the studies. Um, the third um, the third limitation we'd like to highlight here is, and we'll discuss, we'll come to this in the discussion, I believe, is the, the continuum between development interventions and climate interventions. And, and in this case, climate interventions that contribute to a just transition. And, and that also can impart a, a degree of bias within, within the coding that takes place within a, within a studies like this. I'll highlight two further forms of bias. One is sort of, you could call it budget bias, if you like. The fact that monitoring and evaluation only takes place on on, on particular schemes or projects that have budgets allocated to that, and we're aware of that. And the, the last is, I, I suppose, a survivor bias. So it's in fact only the interventions which, um, which do lead to um, interventions which, which progress um, sufficiently um, to end line um, that, that are often evaluated. And in that sense, some of the, some of the early shoots that, that may be contributing to a just transition may not survive um, for, um, to, to the stage of, of end, line, end line evaluation, if you like. Um, so we'll now turn to the, the descriptive, um, some simple descriptives from the, from, the, from, the, from the review. Next slide, please. Um, so overall, the activities that contribute to a just transition can be clustered across um, sort of three, broad, three broad types, if you like. Firstly, technical, financial, and, and development um, activities. Secondly, sort of consultation and landscape activities. And thirdly, activities that really focus on the enabling environment, incentives, and standards. We found across all of the 99 interventions that when, when interventions reported actual climate outcomes, these were distributed quite equally between mitigation and adaptation. And we also found that in terms of the social outcomes from studies, it was mainly social equity and social gains outcomes that focused on the maximization of gains and promotion of social and gender equality that were most prominent. And there was much less attention within the, within the just transition interventions that attempted to limit harms from the intervention or, or weaken the negative impacts, for example, on jobs and, and, and other costs for households. And that's quite important. And I think we'll come back to that in the discussion. So most of the evidence that we we found on results um, focused on, on three, three types of activities. Firstly, in close, inclusive social programs, policies, and investments. Secondly, social dialogue and stakeholder engagement. And thirdly, investments in infrastructure, technology, and support for linkages. Next slide, please. So when we look at the evidence, when we look at the evidence across all of the sectors, um, next slide, please. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. And so what we find here is that a quite, there's quite an equal um, distribution of interventions um, which focus on 
on, on key climate and social outcomes. Um, so for example, um, studies offer, offer data and evidence both on um, reduction of emissions in terms of climate outcomes and also increasing resilience in terms of climate outcomes. In terms of the social outcomes, and we find, we find that studies report data and most prominently on improving social and economic and development gains and providing or promoting um, equity of e equity and gender equity in terms of the four types of of social outcomes um, that the um, that the the studies um, that the studies were were screened against. Um, so the the graphic here illustrates eight eight activity types, um, eight activity codes that the ninety nine studies were um, were screened against, and and those as highlighted in the previous slide that were most common were social dialogue and stakeholder engagement, investments in infrastructure, technology and support for linkages, and inclusive social policies, programs and investments. And then on the x-axis, we've got the outcomes split between climate outcomes and social outcomes. And here we can see the, the most common incidents of climate outcomes within just transition interventions are reduced emissions and enhanced climate resilience. And when we turn to the, the social outcomes, which is to the right-hand side of the x-axis, we found that most of the most frequent types of social outcomes that were included in, in, the, in the studies focused on social and economic um, gains and decent work, as well as social equity and gender equality promotion. So that's a very high level overall picture of the combinations of active intervention activities and outcomes um, that were featured within the, the 99 studies um, that were contributing towards um, a just transition within these four sectors. We'll now hand over to Camilla, who's going to focus on some of the sectoral, sectoral level findings. Over to you, Camilla. Many thanks, uh, Martin. And again, uh, uh, it's great to be with you uh, today. Uh, so let's uh, uh, zoom into some of the uh, sectoral snapshot uh, to uh, delve a bit deeper in what the findings are telling us. And we're, we're going to start on uh, uh, with energy. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, the energy sector is the sector where we find uh, we found the largest number of uh, interventions. Obviously, this is a, a sector that is key uh, to a, a low carbon uh, economy and, and therefore uh, it was uh, it was a pattern to be expected. Um, what uh, the evidence is telling us is that the nature of activities uh, uh, is diverse, uh, but there is uh, a strong incidence of activities that refer to investments in renewable energy infrastructure, technology transfer, uh, linkages in terms of uh, transmission and microgrid, uh, but also um, a good range of measures uh, that uh, focus on the on the on the on, on the policy environment, ranging from uh, a tariff structure or uh, policy reforms and and social policies. Uh, in terms of the geographies of the interventions. Uh, uh, we find a, a good number of interventions coming from South Africa, India, and Indonesia, um, although other countries are represented as well. Um, this is also interesting because many of the interventions that the review uh, found are uh, 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 before are happening before uh, the announcements uh, and the uh, set in motions of the jet peas. Uh, when we consider some of the key uh, enablers and barriers when it comes to uh, just transition interventions in the energy sector, uh, financing uh, um, comes up very strongly uh, as an enabler. And uh, on the other side of the the other side of the coin is that it can act also as uh, a very significant uh, uh, barriers, um, uh, and this is important to consider in relation to high up. Uh, uh, front cost of uh, infrastructure uh, and uh, technologies. Um, other types of uh, softer, if we can call it that, uh, uh, enablers and, and barriers uh, uh, refer to a high level political commitment um, and uh, uh, broad engagement uh, and social dialogue uh, among uh, stakeholders uh, to inform uh, uh, interventions. Um, when we, it comes to barriers uh, and related again to the extent and the effectiveness of social dialogue and stakeholder engagement, lack of trust 
uh, is often uh, seen as an important uh, uh, as an important barrier. If we move on to the next slide, and we can see a snapshot uh, really of the uh, incidence of uh, various outcomes, uh, both on the climate side and on the social side, and uh, and activities. Uh, again, unsurprisingly, uh, there is a, a very uh, strong incidence of uh, uh, mitigation outcomes when it come uh, a, 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 we come to the climate uh, part of the picture. And when it comes to social equity, we've got a good range, uh, but uh, the highest incidence is uh, incidence is uh, about uh, mitigating negative uh, social impacts uh, on the one hand and maximizing uh, social, economic, and decent work gains. Uh, this is interesting because, as we will uh, see um, from uh, the other sector, the attention to uh, mitigating uh, negative impacts is not as uh, strong in other sectors, but obviously this is... Uh, um, uh, reflective of the different natures of the interventions and the transition dynamics there. Um, also, there's a good incident in, in terms of uh, attention, uh, interventions that pay attention to uh, job losses, uh, uh, in both uh, as a minimization and uh, um, as, as measures to, 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 to address them. If we move on to the next slide, uh, um, I'm gonna. We're gonna give you a bit more of a flavor of the kind of interventions that uh, we've covered in the review. Um, as Martin was mentioning, it is a, a very uh, wide range of interventions that we captured. We, ca we cast the net wide uh, because the landscape of just transition in, uh, interventions is diverse. Um, in the case of energy, uh, a, a, an intervention that came through uh, quite significantly is those related to energy access. And there are a number of interventions that focus on uh, particular groups uh, that are in situation of disadvantage in order to, to maximize uh, uh, positive uh, social benefits uh, for them. We have uh, uh, the cases from India and Nepal, but also from South Africa, for example, that uh, uh, focus on uh, women as uh, uh, technicians and providers of renewable energy solutions. And obviously here we've got uh, um, outcomes uh, re in relation to uh, uh, mitigation, um, clean energy. But on the other hand, uh, we've got social outcomes when it comes to uh, in income generation and uh, uh, benefits that uh, relate to um, access to energy. Uh, when, uh, uh, when we move on to the next uh, slide, we can then see how the picture for agriculture is uh, is quite different. Is the second uh, uh, is the second sector uh, with uh, uh, in terms of frequency of interventions, and here the activities are uh, predominantly uh, related to investment in infrastructure and technology. No surprise there, uh, but also uh, with significant attention being paid to social policy programs and investments, and social dialogue and stakeholder and engagement types of interventions. Uh, when it comes to uh, enablers, uh, uh, robust uh, funding and financing models uh, uh, appears to be very important, as is uh, a, a good uh, alignment with national and subnational uh, priorities. Uh, barriers here um, are um, also quite specific uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the, the constraints that relate more on the policy and regulatory environment. A lot of uh, uh, um, barriers relate to red tape uh, that uh, uh, cause delay and, uh, and act as, uh, as constraints in the effectiveness of, uh, of the interventions. There's also barriers that uh, are related to societal norms, uh, in, including gender norms uh, uh, that can restrict uh, women's engagement in uh, the interventions. If we then move on to the uh, next slide, we can see a snapshot of uh, uh, outcomes and uh, activities that uh, are appearing in the uh, in the agriculture and food system sector. Uh, here, uh, the highest incidence uh, it's across uh, um, three main outcomes on the climate side. It's about uh, enhanced climate uh, resilience. So obviously, a very different picture uh, from the energy sector. And on the social side, we've got uh, uh, economic, uh, social, and decent work gains uh, being maximized and, and social and gender equity being uh, promoted. There's also a good to moderate incidence in terms of greater adaptive capacity and reduced uh, expose, uh, exposure 
uh, to shocks. When we come to the, again, um, having a bit of a um, more uh, of, of a, a deep dive into a case study among uh, the many that were covered, and we move on to the next slide, uh, we can see a, a, an intervention that uh, might not be the most uh, obvious that comes to mind when we, of, we think of a climate-related intervention. And this is the India uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. So this is a scheme that was uh, uh, aimed as a, a, a poverty reduction scheme. It's, uh, it guarantees 100 days of minimum wage labor to rural households, and it has a very important uh, poverty uh, reduction uh, role in, in, in rural India. Um, the, uh, the approach that uh, the scheme has is uh, the employment of uh, uh, rural uh, uh, men and women in the development of community assets. The interesting uh, uh, thing is that uh, in recent years, there has been an orientation of uh, a number of the projects that are uh, developed under the scheme by the by the by the the, the employed uh, uh, workers towards uh, climate goals and uh, and here we have a case study from uh, 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 from the Imachal Pradesh Kangra district that uh, uh, that really focuses on how the scheme uh, improved the climate resilience through the building of uh, water management infrastructure uh, and flood walls. Uh, an important characteristics of the scheme it is its uh, uh, decentralized nature and the fact that uh, the priorities are really grounded in the priorities of the communities and therefore they're very closed uh, to the context uh, uh, specific needs. If we go on to the next slide, uh, we have the ecosystem uh, um, sector. I'm, it might not be the best uh, term, but uh, uh, we frame it in, in this way. Ecosystems, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a third sector in terms of incidents. Uh, the activities here are obviously quite, uh, uh, quite diff different. There is a strong emphasis on inclusive social policies and, and programs, and as well as social dialogue and uh, stakeholder engagements. Key enablers include an alignment with uh, national development plans and priorities, uh, um, as well as uh, the creation or the reinforcement of agencies and mechanisms to drive change and protect rights. Barriers uh, um, are really related to the enabling, uh, uh, to a lack of an enabling environment, uh, including technical uh, skills and labor shortages and the uh, gaps uh, between uh, the uh, programs and uh, the needs of, uh, of stakeholders. Uh, and furthermore, there is a problem in terms of exclusions of certain groups, uh, such as women or indigenous people from the wider um, processes uh, of development. If we then move on to the snapshot of uh, the ecosystem uh, um, uh, uh, interventions. We see here that the highest incidence uh, occurs for the social equity and social gains uh, outcomes that relate to equality, uh, both social equality and gender equality. And there is a good uh, to moderate incidence in terms of uh, climate resilience and uh, greater uh, adaptive capacity and reduced exposure uh, to shocks. Uh, if we move on to the um, last slide on this uh, sectoral uh, dive, we have again uh, uh, a case that uh, um, really presents the diver illustrates the diversity of just transition interventions. This comes from the Solomon Islands, and uh, uh, it's a scheme uh, implemented by a local NGO uh, aimed at uh, um, halting uh, uh, deforestation. There was excessive unsustainable logging that was also undermining uh, cultural uh, rights of uh, indigenous peoples and their livelihoods. And through these schemes, uh, there, uh, there is a focus on ensuring compliance uh, uh, to participate in uh, carbon markets, um, as well as alternative livelihood pro uh, uh, programs uh, to prevent logging and provide income sources. And this brought benefits in terms of uh, increased re resilience of uh, indigenous communities. Um, you will notice that uh, we are not going to cover the deep, a deep dive on infrastructure, and that's because uh, we only had the two studies that uh, found infrastructure. This is probably also because infrastructure comes up uh, in other um, sectoral as well, but there is also indeed uh, um, a limitations of uh, uh, the evidence uh, when it comes to uh, in, uh, infrastructure that contributes uh, uh, to just transition. And I will now turn it back to Martin for the 
um, some uh, overarching uh, findings. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Camilla, for that extremely clear presentation of, at the sectoral level, of the incidence of activity outcome combinations extracted from the, the theories of change over the 99 interventions from our from our 76 studies. And just to, to remind, uh, remind participants, why do we focus on the theories of change within these studies? Well, that's because we need to find, well, we're trying to find early indicators, early signals of, of the enablers and the barriers and the contextual conditions um, which may contribute to a successful just transition as the evidence on just transition in non-annex one countries is so limited and the interventions are at such an early stage. Um, so in terms of our 99 interventions, um, we had we had, we had quite comprehensive um, regional coverage, with one exception, there are very, 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 very few studies in small island developing states. We had a we had a huge number of intervention types ranging from climate resilient agriculture through to fossil fuel subsidy reform and skills and knowledge management. We found more, we found more mitigation interventions and adaptation interventions, and most of the interventions were targeted at the household level rather than the firm or public sector, public sector level. And the scale also focused right down from the national scale down to the individual scale. And that also has implications um, in, terms of, in terms of the discussion that we'll turn to. So what are the enablers and barriers that are common across all of these intervention types, across all of these sectors? What we found was that robust funding mechanisms, alignment with needs and priorities, political will and ownership, and stakeholder engagement are common enablers. And we can see these as sort of critical factors that may be required to support and enable just transitions in, in developing countries. There are, of course, nuances within the sectors. Um, so, for example, in the energy sector, um, in terms of political and ownership, we found the need for high level political backing, unsurprisingly, whilst for the other sectors we covered, the political will and ownership focused more at the departmental or regional level. Turning to agriculture and ecosystems, um, the, key, the key enablers here focused on local buy-in and stake of so-called engagement and, and, and trust. And whilst for energy, there was, trust was also important, building trust was also important, and awareness, building awareness, but that was that was important at multiple levels. Next slide, please. When turning to barriers, we found common barriers impeding just transition contributions to just transition interventions across all or most of the, the sectors that we covered. Firstly, bureaucratic and legal hurd hurdles in processes, institutional delay. Also, the exclusion of important stakeholders and unequal distribution of resources and benefits. And this was most prominent in ecosystems. And thirdly, but this is solely in agriculture, and we found inadequate technical skills for implementation and deployment of technologies. So unsurprisingly, we found that the barriers are sometimes the inverse of enablers. And we also found sectoral, sector-specific barriers. Um, so in energy, imbalances in allocation of funding between climate and social goals, and that's something our discussion might, um, might focus on. In agriculture and food, we found a barrier of physical limitations around land and land, ava and climate, land availability and climate instability. And in terms of barriers within ecosystems, um, we found a misalignment um, of the intervention with stakeholder needs, highlighting the importance of, of stakeholder dialogue and ownership within ecosystem interventions. We found examples where the interventions could sometimes shift barriers to enablers, such as through funding, but mainly these barriers, we saw them as being structural conditions, which are which can't be can't be addressed by single discrete interventions. And we'll finally turn to outcomes before turning to our close colleague Anurek. Next slide, please. Um, so that in terms of outcomes. When we, when we extracted the theories of change from the studies, we found that not all of them reported outcomes, many of them only reported at the output level. And so that also just harks, harks back to the point that these interventions are at a very early stage or often at a very early stage of implementation. We found that many interventions are a small scale, um, especially outside of energy. And and overall, though, we found a very good mix, and we were very kind of reassured by this, to be honest, we found a very good mix of both climate outcomes and social outcomes across all of the, across all of the sectors. And unsurprisingly, energy interventions tend to focus on emission reduction, and agriculture ecosystems tend to focus on resilience. And so in, in that sense, 
we were we were reassured by by those those final final items um at this stage i believe we can hand well firstly to Aiden, and then we'll hand over to perhaps um our esteemed colleague anarek over to you Aiden. thank you very much martin thank you very much camilla and um since we're running out of time a bit uh please anarek take it away thank you so much and thanks for this invitation and opportunity so uh, i will focus on three broader themes, what it looks like uh, from the perspective of uh, energy transition in the country context, in the global context, and the roles of uh, big social programs and economic growth activities. So uh, when we talk about energy transition, uh, obviously the motivation for uh, this transition uh, differ across countries depending on uh, whether they have domestic fossil fuel, are they importing it, uh, what are the other resources they have within the countries. They're also driven by the consideration of energy security and future possibilities of creating uh, new uh, industries in the countries. The first thing uh, which we have seen, uh, the conversation starts with jobs. And uh, there's a clear argument that renewable energy industry creates four times more jobs than fossil industry. So it's a very obvious thing to go forward with. But when you see it on the ground, what really happens is the, the fossil resources lie in the locations uh, are not the best renewable energy resources, which means you cannot just transition those people and ask them to kind of start working on clean energy. They don't also have probably the skills. These are the places which are highly eco-sensitive. You cannot do other kind of energy projects in, in those locations. The second is the dynamics at the national and the sub-national level, which also influence a lot of actions and decisions on the ground. And there's always and uh, a chance that they're not aligned uh, what state want to achieve versus what countries are committed to and what they really want to achieve. And the reasons for that in some cases, for example, uh, the coal revenues are the important resource for the states uh, to run their business and even run the programs which we heard before in terms of the rural guarantee programs or employment guarantee programs. So if you're taking away that resource, the state does not have any other revenue resource. Uh, there's also a chance that uh, we are also taking away powers from the local actors, and that is something which has to be seen very carefully. Uh, local actors currently deploying subsidies, or in some cases of energy, they're also deploying diesel uh, kind of a, uh, distribution and all. And how does that impact all of it? The third aspect is not limiting the impact only to the sector. Means uh, you, uh, again, I'm taking example from India. There are around 3.5 million jobs in the coal sector, but there are 20 million jobs which depend on the coal industry. So if you just focus on the coal mining sector, you are not really sufficiently addressing that concern and which will again come back as a barrier. Uh, for example, transport, uh, which really is a huge employment source and it is actually transporting coal. Now, tomorrow you don't need that. So what do you do with that? And, and the last point with regard to with the country's action is the investments which have gone into this there are investments which are made by big utilities based on the public funding. There are investments made by public banks based on the savings uh, the country men have put into th those banks. Now, the moment you ask them to take out or uh, forego those investments, you, there's a chance that the capital markets might collapse. So we have to be really careful about the impact of just transition on the national economy and other aspects of it. So uh, that's the uh, kind of a within country consideration. But if you look at globally what's happening, there's also uh, an aspect of just a transition there. Uh, the new renewable energy capacity or the investments which have gone uh, into renewables in last five, 10 years, 80 to 90% of that has gone into uh, only a few countries. So not all the countries have benefited out of it. How do we make sure the other countries which are not make able to make those investments also benefit from the environmental and the economic benefit of clean technologies. Uh, the, for energy transition, uh, we also need uh, uh, critical minerals, which are also called like green minerals. But these minerals are concentrated in certain countries. Uh, for example, cobalt, uh, which is a very important input for battery technologies, is 50% of is, is in uh, DRC in Congo. Is Congo really benefiting out of this transition? No, because it is getting negatively impacted because of illegal mining. They don't get re uh, enough revenues out of it. But the end product, which is like the batteries, the other countries which are benefiting out. How do we make sure that this transition 
is also providing equal economic opportunities for the countries which have those resources and should be able to benefit from, from that and the, reinvest that into improving the climate resilience of that. The last aspect I like to mention is about uh, these big social programs and economic growth. We heard the example where we saw that uh, uh, one of the state invested the employment guarantee scheme to improve the water resources so that we're taking care of climate uh, impacts. But what it is not looking at is how do we address the impact of transition? Because in certain cases, we have the opportunity to also use these schemes to address the aspect of transition or the job losses, which are not because of climate change, it's because of actions taken to respond to climate change. And that is where I see these as the biggest tools and opportunities to enhance uh, and improve uh, just transition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anurag. I think it's time for us to close here because there is another meeting happening right here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion today. Or we delved into what just transition might look like in different sectors, uh, discussing more in depth the energy transition in developing countries and potential risks that it might bring. Um, this is an emerging issue, obviously, uh, but we ho I hope we can all agree it's a vital one. Thank you very much for coming our, to our talk, to all of our talks throughout this year. And uh, apropos just transition, uh, there will be a, a G GCF's Personnel Association annual assembly meeting in this room uh, where you can discuss maybe on a more practical level your right to just and favorable work conditions. <laughs> Thank you very much.